Peleadio Akaleos Ulemene Muri Kailos Agi Technopolas. Back then I could sing it on and on. Every fight, every old digression, I would sing and sing. And Mikanisos, once I sang for a year, you don't believe me. In Babylon, I sang it differently, but the crowd still came. It was in Alexandria where I started to notice a few empty seats, but I still sang it. Shorter, though, three or four days. You know where it went over really well was Gaul. <laughs> Something about those people, they really took to it. I mean, they were hard to control, of course. They would get up on the tables and, and they would try to sing along, and then afterwards they would go outside, you know, screaming their heads off, lighting fires. It was, it was terrible. <laughs> Every time I sing this song, I hope it's the last time. But oh, sing to me now, oh you goddesses, oh you muses of Olympus, you are everywhere, you are everything, and all we hear is the distant ring of glory, sing! In the old days, I would tell this story in a tavern, or a bar, I guess you would call it. There's something so much easier about talking about these horrors in, in, a, in a bar. Oh, uh, this is the story of the Trojan War, and of two great fighters, Hector and Achilles. <laughs> you use this. Maybe. Ardecia penele adios acaleos. Sing, goddess, the rage of Peleus' son Achilles, murderous, doomed, who cost the Achaeans countless losses, hurling down to the house of death so many sturdy souls, great fighters' souls, but made their bodies carrion. Feast for, for dogs and birds. What drove them to fight with such fury? The gods, of course, honor, pride, jealousy, Aphrodite, an apple, some game or other, Helen being prettier than someone else, it really doesn't matter. The point was that <laughs> Helen had been kidnapped and they had to get her back. It's always something, isn't it? It's a good story, though. I remember a lot of it. <laughs> um, picture a beach, rocky and jagged, with shelters made of overturned bolt holes and tents of black sail, a virtual like city encampment on the beach a mile long, and then a mile and a half inland there's another city, a great walled fortress, and from the top of the battlements Hector can see all the way down to the Greek harbor to the ships there. This is where our story takes place ages ago. And who were those captains of Achaea? Who were the Greek captains there? The, the tally of the men gathered there that I could not begin to recount if I had ten, ten mouths, if I had ten, if I had ten tongues, if I had a, if I had a heart made of iron. Uh. <laughs> Clonius led the armed men that came from Hyra, Thespia, 
and gray are the dancing rings of my Kisilesis. This is coming back to me. We had men from Cornea, deep in the meadows, the men who held Placia, the men who held the rough-hewn gates of lower Thebes. Ochesis, the holy Poseidon's sun-filled grove, men from Arne, green with vineyards, and... That's right, you people don't know any of these places. But these names mean something to me. I, I knew these boys. The point is, I, on these ships were boys from every small town in Ohio. The farmlands and the, and the fishing villages, boys from South Dakota and Nebraska, twangy boys from, from Memphis, San Diego, Palo Alto, the Antelope Valley, you can imagine, right? You can imagine there's soldiers from Bellingham, and Bow, Mount Baker, Ferndale, Springfield, Illinois, Chicago, Buffalo, New York, all five boroughs of the big city, Bronx, Staten Island, Manhattan, Kings and Queens, from Florida, from the Panhandle, evangelists and snake charmers, from the Okeechobee, you have soldiers from Miami who spoke Spanish, soldiers from Miami who spoke French, soldiers from Miami who spoke English, Puerto Rican soldiers, soldiers from Texas, from the Plains, from the Flatlands, from Houston, from, from, from Dallas, from Tennessee, from the mountains east of Virginia, from the mountains east of Seattle, Benton Harbor, Flint, Michigan, there you go. You get it. You get the point. Point is, there's boys on these ships emptied out of all the islands, all the Greek islands, and the ships, so many ships. 50 and 40 and 40 and 60 and 80 and 100, Agamemnon, and 60 and 40 and 80 and 12, Odysseus, 80 and 50 and 30, Achilles and 60 and 70 and 50, these are ships I am counting, not men, and 60 and 80 and 112, Nestor, hun hundreds of ships, that's 120 men on each ship, thousands, tens of thousands, a hundred of thousands of boys just emptied out on this beach. Can you see them? So here we are, for nine years, Muses, please do not make me do this alone. So nine years, we're on this beach. We're fighting to the wall and back. We're fighting one day, we're off the next. The Greeks win one day, the Trojans win another. It's like a tug of war, you know, with nothing to show for it but exhaustion and misery and, and, and loneliness. You know, what was it like? It was like, it was like pain. It was... It was hot. How about that? It was hot. So, nine years. You know, so you, you leave home when your baby's one and you come back and your baby's ten. Or you leave home when your baby's one and you come back and your baby's dead. You know, or your wife is dead. Or your wife has had two affairs and three new children. Honey, listen, all right, don't be mad. Or you come back and you're not even Greek anymore. You're, you're, you're Diocletian now. Or you're Spartan now. They just, they came over and they just took over while you were out hanging out in Troy. And you have no title to your land anymore. And your father's dead. And we do not wear our leggings like that anymore. We have not worn our leggings like that in a very long time. <laughs> You can imagine, though, after nine years, all anybody wants, they just want to go home. They've forgotten what they were fighting for. But what humiliation it would be to go home now, empty-handed, after holding out for so long. It's like someone said, you know, how do you ask someone to be the last person to die for a lost cause? Or... You know, I'm paraphrasing the idea a little bit, but you're in, in the supermarket line, right? And you've been here for 20 minutes and it's not going anywhere, and then suddenly the line next to you starts to move. <laughs> like, do you switch lines now? <laughs> no, no, goddammit, you stay here. This is your line, you stay here. If you switch now, then you've done nothing but waste your time. Patience, my friend. Hold out a little longer. And all this time, too, the, the Greek gods have been watching from up in Mount Olympus. And some of them are cheering for the Greeks, some of them are cheering for the Trojans, and it really is like a sporting event. And back then, it was their only form of entertainment. And they were a 
addicted to it, and they couldn't just allow it to end. And so they would just swoop down, and with a, a poke or a prod or a whisper, they would somehow manage to keep this whole thing raging year after year. I mean, we are talking the old gods here, Zeus and his wife Hera and Apollo and Athena. Well, they haven't been around for a while. Where do the gods go? Where do the old gods go when they die? That's a song, isn't it? And one of them's in a, a bottle of uh, rum, and one of them's in a bottle of vodka. Spirits. And Athena. And a tequila. <laughs> Athena tequila. Gods don't die. They change. They burrow into us. They, they become us. They become our impulses. Lust. Aphrodite. Mischief. Hermes. A good idea is always Athena. Athena tequila. Very good idea. Music. Right? Can't be now. It's bad enough. Only now, it is night. And the men are suddenly getting very sick. I mean, one minute you're polishing your boots, the next minute you're choking on black death. And down on the beach, there is a bonfire. And it is not made of wood. It is made of dogs and donkeys and corpses, all infected with this plague. What is going on? tell you what's going on. We've angered the gods. Our ruler, Agamemnon, he's, he's taken as a prize of war this girl, this 15-year-old girl, whose father just happens to be a priest of Apollo. And the old man, he, he comes to Agamemnon with his carts piled high and says, please, take this ransom. Everything I have, just give me back my child. And Agamemnon says, no. No, and so the old man, he, he even offers to, to pray for the Greeks, you know, if he'll just give back his girl. And Agamemnon says, no. And so all of the generals, the Greek generals, they go to him and they beg, they plead, you know, for him just to give the girl back. And Agamemnon says, no. And so the old man leaves, heart sick. And he goes back and he prays to Apollo. And Apollo hears him. And Apollo gets angry. You ever see an angry God? And Apollo, he takes these arrows and he, he covers them in plague and, and sickness. This is really nasty stuff. And the arrows clanged on the great God's back as he quaked with rage and down against the ship he took to one knee and let fly a shaft and a great terrifying clash rang out of his great silver bow. Shoom! Shoom! Soon, infection, disease, death. There's only one way to end the plague now. Agamemnon has got to give back the girl. I'm not going to give back the girl. I mean, he's the ruler. Nobody can tell him what to do, but we call an assembly. All the Greeks call an assembly. So all of the factions, all of the generals, all of the men, they come together in the meeting grounds, and the meeting grounds shake, you know, and everyone's buzzing like, like, like bees, you know, and then they, they, they're terrified of dying, they're sick of this plague, and when Agamemnon comes in, the men all crowd around him, and they say, get back the girl, you know, respect the priest, take the ransom, and touch someone says, says, shh, quiet, quiet, Agamemnon, the king of men, is going to speak. And Agamemnon takes the staff. Silence. Okay. I'll give the girl back. If that's what you all think is best, I am not a tyrant. I can see it's best for everyone if I do. But, fetch me another prize, and straight away too, or else... I alone, of all the Argives, go without my honor, that would be a disgrace. And the men all kind of turn to each other and they murmur because 
There are no prizes left to give. I mean, they've all been given out. Someone was about to give up something. Not much is certain. And then in the back of the crowd, this great figure starts stirring, and all the men start whispering, yes, yes, this is our man, Achilles. Because in the middle of all of this misery, there is one genius. Achilles is the greatest warrior that has ever lived. He is bigger than Heracles. He is bigger than Sinbad. He's bigger than, I don't know, who's the greatest living warrior today. Doesn't matter, it's bigger than him. And he's not just good at fighting, you know, he's good at the art of war. You have to understand that, okay, Achilles is half mortal, but he's half god too, you know. His mother, Thetis, was a sea nymph. He was raised by a centaur. You know, amazing things like that. And he could talk to animals, well animals could tell, he could understand animals. <laughs> this one time, his horse, uh, I don't remember his horse's name, but his horse would, uh, no, his, so yeah, his horse would come to, this one time, uh, yeah, so Achilles is eating, yeah, he's overeating. Achilles is overeating and overeating and overeating, and his horse turns to him and says, whoa. <laughs> 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 we all laughed. <laughs> oh, and Achilles knows he's going to die here at Troy. He doesn't know how and he doesn't know when, but he knows that he won't be coming home. It's been prophesied. I mean, imagine having to live with that. Anyway, this is Achilles. <sighs> Agamemnon, great field marshal, most strapping man alive. Just how do you expect the generous Argives to give you prizes now? I know of no troves of treasures piled high, lying idle. All that we have dragged from the towns that we have plundered has been portioned out but collected back from the rank and file. Now that would be a disgrace. And, oh man, he should not have said that. The men all kind of shrink back, you know, just leaving him alone to face the commander-in-chief. You can't talk to me that way. I don't care if you are our greatest warrior. You're so brave. You're such a great fighter, so gifted. But don't forget, you are half God, while I am only man. But I will still show you who is greater. What do you want to cling to your own prize when I sit calmly by empty-handed? No, I take what I want. You give me Briseis. Now, Briseis was Achilles' own prize of war and someone that he has grown fond of and her him. She cooks for him. They sleep together. I mean, really, it is Achilles' wife. I mean, you cannot give me orders. The Trojans never did me damage, not in the least. We all followed you to please you, to fight for you, to win your honor back from the Trojans. You and Menelaus, you dog face. And the men all gasped. Not once did you arm for battle with your men or risk ambush. You lack the courage. You can see death coming. Safer by far to foray through camp, commandeering the prizes of any men who speak against you, king who devours his own people. I have no mind to linger here disgraced, brimming your cup and piling your plunder. And Achilles turns to leave. Oh, desert by all means if the spirit drives you home. I'm not going to beg you to stay, not on my account. But take this as a warning as you go. I will be there in person at your tents to take Briseis in all her beauty, your own prize, so that you can know just how much greater I am than you, and the next man up might shrink from matching words with me. And Achilles, he flies into a rage. He grabs the scepter. Now, this scepter, it's a Greek tradition. Whenever anyone wants to speak, officially, it's like a talking stick. It's the origins of democracy, all of that. Anyway, Achilles grabs the scepter and says, Vroom! by this holy oak that will never again flower, I swear to you, that I will never fight again. All these men, let them be swept. Let every Greek dry. And let you, Agamemnon, come to me, repentant, groveling on your knees, wishing you had never said these words to me. And you can eat your heart. And you can eat your words. And I swear to you, I still won't fight. Trojan, Hector, will slaughter all of you. You dare to humiliate me? 
and Achilles raises his arm against Agamemnon and all the soldiers are like, what is he doing? And, then, and at the last minute, his head yanks back. And Achilles can see what the men cannot, that Athena has swooped down and has come up behind him and grabbed him by the back of the hair and whispers in his ears, you cannot kill Agamemnon. And Achilles says, why? And she says, obey. And so he has no choice, right? But he takes the scepter and he's just like, smashes it to the ground. Not really, but he's furious. He says, none of you, none of you at this meeting will speak for me. We will see, we will see how you all do without me. And he storms off, and the entire Greek army is just standing there like, uh. <laughs> and Agamemnon is like, who the fuck cares about him? And he storms off. You know, and this, this is the rage of Peleus' son Achilles. This is how it starts. And it is so infuriating. <laughs> and they come, Agamemnon's men, and they take Briseis to his tents, and Achilles weeps, and slipping far away from his companions, he sits down on the shores of the gray heaving sea, scanning his mother's endless oceans. And so the war rages on, but Achilles stays in his tents, waiting and fuming and betting against his own side, the Greeks. I wish that I could show you a picture of Troy, but this is what it looks like. The first thing you see when you walk through the skiing gates is a, a great plaza and there's a great fountain and you hear the sound of running water and you begin to notice that the sound of running water is everywhere. There's waterfalls and little pools. You notice too that every house has its own fountain and so the sound of running water becomes a sort of music all around you and it mingles with actual music of, of lyre and flutes and singing and you notice too that each house has its own private part but a public part as well so every house has its private part but it spills into the public part so when you walk through Troy what happens is that you just you see everybody and everybody sees you and they have events of all kinds they have concerts and performances and there's this great sense of civic duty so they'll get together and they'll, they'll talk about things like, what are we going to do about that fig tree that's dying? How do we save the, the dying fig tree? And so they'll form a committee to do something about the dying fig tree. And there's this great respect for Priam's family, the royal family, for Priam and all his sons who've created something stable here, right? They've fought off invasion after invasion. And so what you get when you walk through the streets of Troy is this great feeling of calm and peace and serenity. Oh, all of that was before the war, of course. Now, Hector. <laughs> Hector. Man-killing Hector. Shining Hector. Hector Hippodamoye. Hector, tamer of horses. Um, it's very hard to describe Hector. His little brother calls him um, sharp axe, always cleaving forward. Hector believes in institutions, he believes in the city, and he believes in the army, he believes in the family. You know, he just, I, I think, it's just a little hard to describe a good man. Hector, is a, he's a brave man, but deep down, I really do think he would just rather be taming horses. But Hector is the eldest son. You know, the eldest of many, many children, <laughs> dozens and dozens of children by King Priam and, and various mothers. I mean, I do not remember all of their names. Oh my God, I would have to look that up. Uh, oh, but one brother, of course, um, Paris. <laughs> Every 
time Hector sees Paris, he can't stop yelling at him, and for good reason, too. I mean, Paris is, Paris is the kind of guy, Paris actually made the case that it's better for him to stay inside with the women and children than to go out and fight. <laughs> And the one time he does go out and fight, Aphrodite comes swooping down. She can't stand it. She has to save him because he's just so pretty or something. And she picks him up by the scruff of his neck and she slings him back into the sheets in Helen's bed. And Paris stays there. That's who Paris is. You know, it goes something like, um, um, no, I don't know. I just think if I went out and fought that I might get captured, and then they would ask you for ransom, and that would put you in an awkward position, and I don't know, I just think it might be better for everyone if I just <laughs> stayed inside and mm -hmm. lived out the remainder of my days, you know, knowing that I was a uh, coward. <laughs> and it's hard to argue with that, right? Because you want to say, yes, you are a coward, but he just called himself that, so where do you go from there? Anyway, everyone always wants to know about Paris, you know, they say, tell us about Paris. Paris isn't really all that important to the story. I mean, I know he is the one who kidnapped Helen and brought her to Troy, which was the start of the whole war to begin with. And I know, I know, oh my God, he's so handsome. But <laughs> he's just not that interesting to me anymore. But Hector, Hector, you know, the thing about Hector is he's proud, right? Troy has these allies come from all over Ilium, all these other tribesmen and chieftains and generals, and he won't let anybody else lead the charge, you know? He's full of hubris, but he's decent, you know? It's complicated. Hector's a good husband, he's a good son, he's a good father, he's... Okay. Um, so one terrible day, the Trojans are struggling because the Greeks still have ferocious fighters on their side, like um, Diomedes and Ajax the Greater. And, and on this day, the Greeks are winning because, well, the gods, I mean, the gods oh, have made a mess of things. Athena has even come down, put on her own helmet, and is fighting alongside the Greeks. You know, she even stabs her own brother Ares in the stomach, and Ares goes off complaining to Zeus, and then Zeus, no, actually, no, it's a mess. So, on this day, anyway, with the help of Athena, the Greeks, they chop and they hack and they are decimating the Trojans' lines. And they're pushing them back towards the wall again and again. And Hector and his brothers, you know, they try to stand their ground, but they're getting pushed back again and again. And Hector starts to worry, you know, that the men are just going to lose their nerve and run off and hide behind the walls. And so Hector and his brother... Um, Anyway, they decide that what they have to do, they have to do anything they can just to get Athena back on their side. And so Hector, still in his heavy armor and heavy helmet, he leaves the battle and he runs all the way back to the city of Troy to ask the Trojan women to pray to Athena. And the first one to see him coming is his mother, Hecuba, the queen. And she runs to him and grabs his hands and says, Oh, my darling poor child. Why have you left the bitter fighting? Look how they wear you out. Wait, here, I will bring you some mellowed honey wine. When a man is exhausted, wine will give him strength. But don't give me wine now, mother. You'll sap my limbs. I'll lose my nerve for war. No, go pray to Athena. Ask her to stop helping the Greeks. And then, oh, that face that launched a thousand ships. Helen sees him and cuts him off, intercepts him and sits him down. Oh, my dearest brother, dearest to me, bitch that I am. <laughs> oh, how I wish that on that first day my mother had brought me into the world, that I had been whisked away in some dark whirlwind into the mountains. <laughs> but, as it is, the gods have ordained all of this, and I can only wish that I had been the wife of a better man. <laughs> <laughs> but Hector had no time for any of this. He only wanted to see his own wife, Andromache, and their son, Astanix, who was like six months old. And he runs home, and he looks for them. And they're not home, and he starts to look everywhere, and he actually starts to panic a little bit that he can't find them until someone finally tells him they're up on the battlement. So still, in his heavy armor, and his heavy helmet, he runs up the stairs, 
up to the armaments and out to the wall, and then he sees them standing in the sunlight there, his wife and baby boy, and he smiles, and that's a rare thing. And Andromache senses him behind her and turns around and says, Hector, why are you just standing there staring at us? Can't you speak? <laughs> what are you doing home in the middle of the day? Is, is the war over? <laughs> no. It's a a bad day for us. Hector, listen to me. You are all I have. Achilles killed my father, my mother, all of my brothers. All I have left is you and the boy. Stay here. Don't go back out to the fight. At least draw the army back up to that spot where the wild fig grows. You know, three times already they've tried to strike that spot on the wall where it's low. That would make me look like a coward. I can't retreat, even though I wake up every night and sweats dreaming of you, Widow, and the boy, and the Hector reaches for a Stanix, but a Stanix wails. Ah! Whoa, what did what I do? What I do? It's your helmet, dear. Take it off. Oh. No, 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 no. Okay, okay. That is just Daddy's helmet. That is just Daddy's helmet. One day, you will wear a helmet like that. One day, you will be as brave a fighter, even as me, and you will ride a horse, a great dark horse, just like mine, and you will fly, you will fly through the air on that horse, coming back home, covered in the bloody gear of your mortal enemies. Ha! Okay, that's enough, Hector. <laughs> Reckless one. Have you no pity for him, our helpless son, or for me, for the heavy fate that weighs me down, your widow, all too soon? And oh, gee. Why so distressed? No man will throw me down to death against my fate. And fate, no man alive has ever outrun it. Brave man or coward alike, I tell you, it is born with us, the day that we are born. Still, stay. I can't, I have to go back. Come, give me a kiss. And don't cry. Pray. And Hector, he puts his heavy helmet on, he walks back out into the front lines, and... Oh. Have any of you ever seen the front lines? Let's take just a... I would like, I'd like you to know just a little bit like what it looked like, what he was going back to out there, that bloody field covered in boys. Oh! I have a, a photograph, it's a, a different war, of course, um, like a hundred years or so ago, outside the trenches on another particularly bad day. Hmm. I can't find it, but, so here, outside the trenches on another particularly bad day, you see this photo and you look at it and you say, um, that's a battlefield covered with corpses. And it is, but it's not, you know, because this is Tom, you know, and this is Matthew, and this is Brendan, and this is William, he was 21, you know, Tom was 19, Brendan was 18. Brendan was gonna go to Oxford, he had gotten in on a scholarship because of his writing. His father was a postman, and he was gonna be the first one in his family to go to university, but he never, he never did because Do you see? But this, this is the war that I want to tell you about because on this day, the Trojan women prayed to Athena and those prayers seemed to work and the Trojans started fighting like never before and the Greeks still had no Achilles. He stayed in his tent, which began to take its toll. And this, this is what war looks like. At last, the two armies clashed. 
At one strategic point, they slam their shields together in pike scraped pike with the grappling strength of fighters armed in bronze and their round shields pounded, boss on welded boss, and the sounds of struggle roared and rocked the earth. Cries of victory and screams of men mixing in one breath, fighters killing, fighters killed, and the ground stringing with blood. The wildly astute winter torrents raging down from the mountains, swirling into a valley, hurl their waters together, plunging down into a gorge and a mile away on a hillside. Some shepherd hears that distant thunder. So from these two grinding armies rose the cries and crash of war. And now rout and terror and relentless strife broke two strife sister of man slaughtering Ares. Ares is comrade in arms and strife only the slightest thing when first she rears her head but strife's head now hits the sky as she strides across the very earth and strife now hurls down that great level of hate amidst both sides wading into the onslaught and flooding the men with pain. I never could come up with the right epithet for Patroclus. Horseman, son of Menelaus. You know what I should call him is friend. Patroclus was Achilles' friend. His only friend, his childhood friend. He was older than Achilles, he was more practical, he was good with horses. So Patroclus' father had sent Patroclus to live with Achilles, to look after him. He said, you are older than Achilles, you are wiser than him, you counsel him and he will listen to you. So really they were more than friends, they were brothers. And really they were more than brothers. They loved each other. So when Achilles couldn't sleep, when he was up shaking in his bed from the terrors of war, or the impending doom of his own prophesied death, and Patroclus would sleep with him and hold him and comfort him. You know, friends. And Patroclus was a good fighter too, but when Achilles quit the battle, Patroclus quit too. There was never any question that his first allegiance was to his friend. But on this day, on this day, when the Trojans so decimated the Greek lines and they pushed through their defenses and they pushed past the sentries at the barricades and into the very camp and Patroclus had been spending all day running up and down the beach, you know, just watching them carry out corpses until there was no place left to carry them. And he sees now that Agamemnon is even wounded and Odysseus is wounded and one of the, the medics is wounded and he just can't stand it anymore. And he goes running into Achilles' tents and he says, don't be mad at me. But your anger is making you blind. Can't you see the Trojans are destroying us? Is your heart made of iron? If you can't fight, if you can't go out there and push them back past our defenses, then let me, I will wear your armor. I will take that chance, but you are wrong. You will be remembered as a fool if you don't fight this day. <clears throat> I swore. I swore that I would never fight for Agamemnon. I don't care if they storm into these very tents. It's not even about anger anymore. It's about the thought of breaking my word. I can't do it. But you, that is a good idea. All of Troy comes raining down on us. Daring and wild and why? Because they cannot see the brow of my helmet flash before their eyes. But you put on my armor. And just the thought of me back in battle and the Trojans will be filled with terror. Go, go, put on my grease, my breastplate, my helmet, but promise me you do not push them back farther than our defenses. Don't push them so near the wall, not without me. You promise? Yes, I promise. And Patroclus begins to put on the grease. Can you see him? In the breastplate. Young Patroclus, I can't help it, I always think of him as young. He's so little, he's, he's too little for Achilles' armor, so he's kind of banging around inside it. Oh, Patroclus, straight at the pressing Trojan ranks you swooped. And at first, he does as he promised. 
and just the sight of Achilles' armor, and the Trojans do lose their nerve, and he pushes them back past the gates, and then further, and then further. Patroclus is good at this, you know? He never knew he was so good at it. You know, and he smells the smell of blood and bronze, and he's been waiting nine years just to show everybody what he's made of, and he's got Achilles' armor on, and he just feels good, you know? You ever get that feeling that for whatever reason you could just kill somebody? <laughs> just rip their head off, tear them limb for limb, you don't even care? That guy who cuts you off in traffic and you just want to ram him, you just want to ram him and you can see the, the twisted metal in the aftermath and the smoke coming up from the, the, the accident and the, and the airbags and you hope the airbag smothers him. And if it doesn't, you're going to get out of your car and you're going to wrench him out like the jaws of life and he's going, you idiot, why'd you try to cut me off? Ah! Glint of spear tore into his opponent's chest. He smashed the spearhead through the teeth so hard, hoisting the Trojan, dragging him, mouth gaping, heart bursting with fury. He's pushed him down on the ground face first. Ah! Dead as he fell, Peck sprung into action, picks up a stone, tosses it right between the eyes, both brows crushed, skull caved in, eyes bursting from the sockets. Nothing can stop Patroclus now. He is a killing machine. Patroclus like something superhuman. Patroclus and his men hungry as wolves that rend and bolt raw flesh. The hearts filling with this battle frenzy that never dies. They gorge on their kills until all their jaws drip red with bloody meat. Belching bloody meat, but the fury never shaken builds inside their chests, though their bloated bellies burst. It is a blur of killing. One man slashed, another gored, another sliced, sinews shredded, bronze dripping, cut the belly, another cutting out the tongue. One guy cracked on the bony socket and then rinsed the whole thing out. Impaled. More. More. Stabbed. More. Chopped. Snapped. Hacked. Hewn. Hacked until the whole earth ran red with blood. Blood. Blood and red death and it feels good. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Um, listen, um, um, sometimes it happens. Um, it's actually why I don't do this anymore. Why I don't do this anymore? Um, so Patroclus, he, he piles corpse on corpse on the ground that rears us all. And then suddenly something happens that I've never quite understood. Impossibly, his helmet flies off. And then part of his armor falls away. And then he's pushed to the ground like some force pushes him there. You know, the helmet never fit anyway. He had to stuff rags in it just to keep it on his head. He had to stuff rags in the breastplate too. It was Achilles' armor. He had like 400 pounds on him or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. But after all of that struggle, he just loses his helmet and his armor. You know what people said at the time? At the time, people said it was Apollo. Lord Apollo was on Hector's side and Lord Apollo had swooped down. You know, and came up behind him and just with a little, you know, just a little, and his helmet flies away, and a little, and his armor falls off, and just a little, and Patrick is like, and he stands up, totally vulnerable, and then out of nowhere, this Darden guy, complete nobody, like, first day of fighting, never fought before, but he's on some sort of rampage, you know, he's killed like nine people, and he's knocked five riders off of their chariot, the things, and he's, he just literally happens to be behind Patroclus at the right time, and he just, boom. And Patroclus, he doesn't even feel it. He just turns to see this Darden there, and the Darden 
sees who it is, and his eyes go wide, and he pulls out a spear, and he runs away. And then Patroclus, the end of life, came blazing up before you. Hector, Hector sees Achilles' armor, and Hector makes his move. He comes running from I don't know how far off, but he gathers up a full head of steam, and he's running, and he's running, and he takes a spear, and he raises it, and what do we say? It went driving up Patroclus' bowels. The brazen point went jutting straight out Patroclus' back, and he drives him down into the dust. And Hector begins to rage. Patroclus! Surely you thought you would storm my city down, rest from the women of Troy, their days of freedom, you fool. The vultures will rend your body, blood and bone. Not for all his strength can Achilles save you now. And you fool, in what orders he must have filled your head with, and you fool, you obeyed him. You won't live long yourself. Already I can see them. Death and the strong force of faith to drag you down. And then death cut Patroclus short. And the end came closing in around him and flew free his limbs. Dragged his soul down winging to the dark house of death, but Hector, he just could not stop yelling at him, even though he was dead. You think you know my fate? Death, why should I fear death? Death is on my side. Death is my brother, and together we will murder all of you Greeks. And with that, he put his heel on Patroclus' chest and pulled out the brazen point and flipped him on his back and began to rip off Achilles' armor savagely, awkwardly, like an animal. I mean, Hector was a decent guy, you know, he was honorable. But at that moment, you know, it's, it's what happens. You think to yourself, not me. I'm not like that. I'm peaceful. And then it's like a trick of the blood. And suddenly, rage. Do you see? This dark cloud of grief came shrouding down over Achilles after Patroclus' death, overpowering all of his power, and sprawling out in the dust, he suddenly lets out this terrible, mournful cry, and far out at sea, his noble mother, Thetis, hears him. This is what he says to his mother. He's dead, and I sent him out there. It should have been me. What do I do now? If only strife could die from the hearts of gods and men in anger that causes the sanest man to lash in fury, bitter gall, sweeter than dripping streams of honey that cloud the chest and blind like smoke, like the anger the great king, Agamemnon, king of men, has roused in me now enough. Let bygones be bygones, what's done is done. And now I will go forth and meet that murderer face to face. Hector, who took from me the dearest soul I know. The waves, you have no armor. Hector, where's your armor now? Have you forgotten? Thetis calls after him, wait here. And she goes running off to Hephaestus, the great crippled god of fire. And she asked him to make new armor for Achilles. And Hephaestus waves his hand. And 30 tripods swing into that action. And he swings his hands again. And 30 bellows began to pump and blow beneath the cauldrons, turning the black coal white. And again and again, and strings of metal fly through the air, tin and silver and gold and bronze, plunging down into the cauldrons to be melted down in degrees for Achilles' legs and a breastplate and a bronze helmet. 
and a shield, the most magnificent shield. Hephaestus, he starts crafting this orb as large as a room, and around it he puts the river of the ocean, and the moon, and the stars, and the earth, and he hammers in two cities. In one, a wedding is taking place, and a bride is being da led down a hillock past some trees to her nervous groom, a city at peace. And in the other, it's a great walled city, and outside the gates, a siege is taking place, and two great armies clash by the river, and he crafts a field wide with furrows, with teams of horses working the field back and forth, and a group of farmers taking refreshments, large cups of wine and honey, and another group of farmers leading the cattle back from pasture, and a lion attacks one of the bulls, and a great pool of black blood forms at the bottom of the shield. And there's a boy playing a lute, the most heartbreaking music, the song of a dying light. And around the boy, a group of children are dancing and singing, and around them, a group of people laughing and clapping. This is the shield the Festus made Achilles. It was so bright. It was like when you are so a sailor out at sea, and you're looking out into the darkness to find some, some sign of, of shore. Well, today you have lighthouses, right? But back then, we would just have maybe like one guy up on a mountain, a shepherd or something, with a, a strong light and a mirror, just in some desperate attempt to keep the sailors safe from the rocks. And you're out there in the storm, in the darkness, all around you, just looking for some sign of hope out there in the nothingness. And then you see it coming at you, just this beam. That's how Achilles... New shields shone, just so bright like that. Just shined out so far, like a beacon. And so Achilles, in his new armor, he dashed towards the city, heart racing, rushing on like a, a champion stallion at full tilt. And Hector was the first to look up to see him coming, swooping across the plains blazing like a star. And now I don't have to tell you, do I, that with Achilles back in the fight, the tides have turned, right? The Greeks are winning. They are pushing the Trojans back inside their own walls. And there stood Hector, chained fast to his own deadly fate. Well, this is what he looked like. Uh. Huh. And this is what he was thinking. No way out. If I slip inside the gates now, my army is ruined and I would be ashamed to face the men of Troy and the Trojan women in their long flowing robes. Better by far to stand my ground once and for all, kill him and go home, or to die in glory at his hands before the gates. But then he stopped. But wait. What if I would put down my studded shield and my heavy helmet, lead my spear against the ramparts and go forth and meet him just as I am? I could offer to give him Helen back, yes? Yes, and all her riches, all the treasures that Paris long ago hauled home and the hollow ships to Troy, which have been the start of all this endless fighting. And really that's what we've all been thinking all along, isn't it? Just give Helen back. Yes, yes. And then I, along with all the Trojan council, could swear an oath, hold nothing back, share and share alike. All the handsome hordes our citadel hides within its depths, and... Oh, why debate it, friend? Why hash it out? There's no parlaying with this man now. Just look at him, because already Achilles was starting to close in like a god of war, like a raging fire, like a blazing, rising sun. And Hector, looking up to see him coming, he began to tremble, and he began to lose his nerve, and he could hold his ground no longer. He turned his back on the wall, and he fled in fear, and Achilles turned after him, breakneck on in fury, and Hector ran along the walls of Troy as fast as his legs would carry him, on and on, past the lookout, past the wild fig tree tossed with wind, the two of them, their speed building like champion stallions, faster and faster, at breakneck pace, whirling, three times around the city of Priam, endless like a dream where one man cannot catch the other fleeing out ahead and he cannot escape or his pursuer overtake him.
These are the scales that the gods use to weigh the fates of men. And Zeus used them now to weigh the fates of Achilles and Hector. These are real, actual things, these scales. They exist. <laughs> And down went Hector's day of doom, dragging him down into the dark house of death. And just like that, the gods left him. <sighs> no more will I run from you, Achilles. Now I find my nerve to stand my ground and meet you face to face. Come, let us swear an oath to the gods, the highest witnesses, that if I am to last it out and wrest your life from you, that I will give your body back to your comrades if you swear that you will do the same for me. Hector, stop. There can be no binding oaths between men and lions. Wolves and sheep enjoy no meeting of the mind. So it is with you and me. If you could just see how they looked at each other. And what did they see? I wonder if he's scared. I mean, look at him. He's jumping up and down, he's shaking his spear, but I know that deep down underneath all of that, he just wants to stay alive. I almost think that we could just leave here, you know, just walk off together and grab a beer somewhere, get drunk together and talk about anything. Hey, remember that day a few days ago we had you pinned against the wall and then one of your spearmen took out one of our chariot riders out of nowhere and all of a sudden the whole thing turned? That was wild, huh? <laughs> yeah. Or you remember that time that great bird plopped down right in the middle of everything and everyone stopped fighting for a second and just stared at it, blinking at us? What was that, a heron? <laughs> no, that was an egret. Oh, we call those herons. Oh. Aren't herons the ones with the blue tinge to the upper wing? And, yeah, but we, uh, no, we call those egrets. <laughs> but no, whatever they were thinking, this is what they said. Hector, now you will pay at a price for all my comrades' grief, all that you have killed in the fury of your spear. And with that, shaft raised Achilles hurls and the long shadow of his spear flies through the air, but seeing it coming, <coughs> mighty Hector ducks away, and turning behind him, he sees the brass point stab the earth behind him. Oh! Uh. Ah. Oh, you missed! Oh, the mighty Achilles! All oh, bluster and cunning words, that's all you are! Ah, but now it is your turn to dodge the fury of my spear, and with that Hector hurls in the great shadow of his spear, flies and his strikes Achilles' shield, the dead center hit, but glances off and flies away into the dust, and Hector sees the entire power of his throwing arm spent in one missed shot, and he has no second spear in reserve, and deep in his heart he knows the truth, and he calls aloud, now my time has come. Let me die. But not without a struggle. Not without glory. Not without some great clash of arms that even men down through the ages will talk about in years to come. And with that he swooped in, swinging high his wedded sword. And Achilles charged too, bent on killing Hector. Flames and sparks bursting from the point of his spear as he drove to Hector, flying through the air, scanning Hector's splendid body for a place best to pierce. That's right. I forgot. Hector is still wearing Achilles' armor, right? So Achilles flying through the air, he's just looking at himself. He's looking at this image of himself, looking for a place to strike the death blow, looking for some weak spot to pierce, and he knows exactly where it is because it's his armor. There's one spot that lay exposed where the collar lifts the neck from the shoulders here, where the end of life comes quickest. There did Hector die. There did Achilles drive the brazen point, throwing Hector down into the dust. And mighty godlike Achilles rages over him. Hector, 
Surely when you ripped my armor from Patroclus, you thought you would be safe. So far from the fighting I was, you fool. The dogs and birds will maul and shame your corpse while the Achaeans bury my friend in glory. And Hector, struggling for breath, his helmet flashing, says, I beg you, by your life, by your parents, do not let the dogs eat me by the Argive ships. You take whatever princely ransom my noble mother and father offer you and give my body back to my comrades to take me home again. And say, Bleh! Beg no more, you fawning dog, by my parents. <laughs> Would to God they would give me the rage to cut your flesh from your bones and eat you raw. Such agonies you have caused me ransom. <laughs> I know you well. I see myself before you. Iron in that chest, that heart of yours. But beware, or my curse may draw the wrath of the gods that day when Paris and Lord Apollo, for all your fighting strength, destroy you at the skinning gates. And death cut him short, and the end came closing in around him. Flew free his limbs, and his soul went winging down to the dark house of death. Sons of Achaea, raise your songs in victory. We have brought down mighty Hector, the man that the Trojans glorified in their city like a god, and full of fury, and bent on shaming Hector. Achilles pierced the tendons behind his feet, heel to ankle rip them through, and slashing together strips of rawhide, strung them through the bloody holes, and lashed them to the back of the cart of a chariot, climbed aboard the car, and he whipped his team to a frenzied pace, holding nothing back, and a great cloud of dust rose up from the man he dragged behind him, his dark hair swirling in the dust, his face so handsome once, Low down in the dust, and if you could have seen it, the waist, the, it reminds me, there was this one time during the conquest, it was a hot day during the siege of Sumer. Siege of Sargon, Persian War, Peloponnese War, Wars of Alexander the Great, the Punic War, Gaelic War, the Great Jewish Revolt, the Yellow Turban Uprising, the War Against the Moors in North Africa, the Roman Persian War, the Fall of Rome. The Byzantine Arab War, the Muslim conquest of Egypt, the first siege of Constantinople, the Chinese Arab War, the Saxon Wars, the Viking raids across Europe, the Bulgarian siege of Constantinople, the Zanj uprising in southern Iraq, the Viking civil wars, the Norman conquests of Ireland, the first crusade, <coughs> the second crusade, the third crusade, the fourth crusade, children's crusade, fifth, sixth, Seventh, Eighth, Ninth Crusade, the Norman Conquest of Britain, the Mongol Invasion of Afghanistan, the Mongol Invasion of China, the Mongol Invasion of Russia, the Mongol Invasion of Vietnam, the Hundred Year War, the Chinese Domination of Vietnam, the Polish-Lithuanian Teutonic War, the Hunger War, the Fall of Constantinople, the War of the Roses, the War of the Priests, the Muscovite-Lithuanian War, the Spanish conquest of Mexico, the Mughal conquest of India, the War of Two Brothers, the Spanish conquest of Peru, the 35-year war, the Pequot War, the First, Second, Third English Civil Wars, Cromwell's conquest of Ireland, Cromwell's conquest of Scotland, the 335-year war, the Second Cherokee War, the American Civil War, the French Revolution, 
the Haitian Revolution, the Napoleonic Wars, the Bolivian War of Independence, the Argentine War of Independence, the Mexican War of Independence, the Venezuelan War of Independence, the War of 1812, the Colombian, Chilean, Peruvian, and Ecuadorian Wars of Independence, the Lower Canadian Rebellion, the Upper Canadian Rebellion, the Second Seminole War, the War of the Priests, the War of the Mormons, the Honey War, the First Anglo-Afghan War, the Crimean War, the American Civil War, the Sioux War, the Second Anglo-Afghan War, the Boer War, the Cuban War of Independence, the Spanish-American War, the Mexican Revolution, the Russian Revolution, World War I, the Irish War of Independence, the Third Anglo-Afghan War, the Japanese Invasion of Manchuria, the saudi yemeni War, the Spanish War, World War II, the Palestine Civil War, the Israeli-Arab War, the Cold War, the Korean War, Vietnam, Bay of Pigs, Sand War, Six-Day War, Laos, Cambodia, the Troubles, Prague Spring, the Nicaraguan Revolution, the Salvadorian Civil War, the Contra War of Nicaragua, the Iran-Iraq War, the Falkland War, the First Intifada, the Israeli Invasion of Lebanon, the U.S. Invasion of Grenada, the U.S. Invasion of Panama, the Rwandan Civil War, the Afghan Civil War, Bosnia, Herzegovina, Chechnya, Afghanistan, Kosovo, Iraq, Bosnia, Afghanistan, Georgia, Haiti, Iraq, Pakistan, Lebanon, Kenya, Zimbabwe, Somalia, Georgia, Pakistan, Iraq, Afghanistan, Libya, Syria. Hecuba opened her mouth. Um, Hecuba opened her mouth because all this time they had been watching from atop the wall. Hector's mother, Hecuba, his father, Paris, his sister, Cassandra, Helen, all of his sisters, all of Hector's family watched him die from atop the wall. All along the wall, Hector's family wailed with the grieving Hecuba. Except Hector's wife, Andromache, she, she wasn't there. She was inside weaving. She, she was busy drawing a bath because she had convinced herself that Hector would be home. Hector would want a bath when he came home. But she hears the wailing women, and she recognizes the voice of her mother-in-law. And never in all of her life has she heard the voice of her mother-in-law sound like that. And her heart starts racing, and her legs go numb. It's a terrible moment, isn't it? The feeling starts with a an intuition. Why is the phone ringing at 3 in the morning? Why isn't it? Why isn't she called by now? She should have called by now. It's late. She's very late. He should have been home by now. The plane should have landed by now. Oh, I know it. Something terrible has fallen on Priam's children. And Hecuba, she starts to walk just to keep herself calm. But she has this throbbing sensation in her whole body and her vision starts to see stars and it starts to go dim and as she climbs up to the battlements and into the sunlight before she can even ask any sort of question she looks up and she sees the body of her dead husband being dragged behind Achilles chariot and she starts yelling at him now now you go down to the house of death deep in the dark earth and leave me here a grieving widow lost in the royal halls and your boy only a baby what good are you to him now or him to you don't you know that even if he escapes the horrors of the wars with the argives that pain and labor will haunt him all of his days 
really what she is saying is, I told you so. And Hector's body disappears in a cloud of dust behind Achilles' chariot, and Achilles speeds off into the distance. He drags the corpse all the way home to the Greek camp, and he dumps it out on the sand, and the Greek soldiers all cheer, hey! And they celebrate, and they drink, and carouse, and sing songs, but Achilles' fury, it just won't end. And still bent on shaming Hector, he drags his body back up on the chariot, round and around Patroclus' tomb for an entire day. And then another day, and another day, and another day, and another day. And the question you have to ask yourself is after 10 days, what is there left to drag? Yes. But you would be wrong about that. Because, well, the gods, <laughs> the gods, the gods, after all of this, after, after abandoning him, leaving Hector to die, now they change their minds. And Zeus, looking down at him, he, he covers his body in a sort of a a storm, a shield, and so after all of this, Zeus loves him after all, and his body is just perfect, it's untouched, it's even sweet smelling, it's impossible. And during all of this, on top of the wall, for ten days the Trojans still watch. The smoke coming up from Patroclus' tomb, the dust coming up from Hector's body, being dragged around and around for days, songs of the victory of Achilles drifting over on the wind, and King Priam, he can't stand it anymore, and he decides that even though he's almost 80 years old, he is going to slog across that battlefield. He's going to take a wagon full of treasure. He's going to ransom everything he has just to get the body of his son back. And so he leaves in the middle of the night with nothing but an old charioteer to keep him company, wagon full of treasures, and they're not even halfway across the battlefield, and already they're both getting tired, and already they're weary. And then, out of nowhere, this young man appears, whoop, wearing fabulous sandals, and he says, what are you two old guys up to? You're crossing into uh, enemy territory, you know, crossing behind the Greek lines with a uh, wagon full of treasures. Have you lost your minds? <laughs> I tell you what, old man, I will help you. And Priam asks who the young man is, but he just says, but just like that, with a clap of the hands, and they whisk across the field, past the battlements, past the Greek sentries, into camp, and when they get to the great gates, so big it usually takes eight men to drag them open. The young man simply snaps his fingers and the gates fly open and he turns and he says, old man, I will tell you who I am. I am Hermes, but I can stay no more. And just like that, he's gone. And Priam looks up to see Achilles standing up from the dinner table. And it is like looking into the eyes of a deathless god. It is breathtaking. Great Achilles, you are surprised to see me here, an old man. I am King Priam, King of Troy, and I come to you with a wagon full of treasures to ransom myself, my kingdom, everything I have for the body of my son. Look how I kneel at your feet. I will do what no man on earth has ever done. I will put my lips to the hand of the man who killed my son. And Achilles, he walks over and he says, he says, you amaze me, old man. Get up. Do not kneel at my feet. You have a father. He is so far away with you and Troy. Think of him. Think of how he misses you. Think of how he is suffering without you. I ask you as a father, as your father would ask me, please give me back the body of my son. I never wept before I came to Troy. In the last three days, it seems that is all I do. And I have reason to weep, and so have you, old man. And with that, the two men began to weep and weep and weep. Patroclus was crying for his dead son, and Achilles was crying for his father, and for his dead friend Patroclus, and for himself. Enough tears, enough grief, 
What good will they do? I will never see my father again, and they certainly won't bring your son back to life. You give me back my boy! You took him from me. His body is out there rotting on the beach. You let me see him. You give me back my son. Do not make me angry, old man. You have no idea how my heart is so sick with rage. I am sick with it. Do not stir my rage. Do not stir my anger, old man, or I will. And then, this is the part that I love to sing. And I hope that I can make you see it. Because... For once, Achilles, who was addicted to rage, as so many of us are, really, when it comes down to it, this fighting man, he feels the rage welling up inside of his heart, and then he, he makes it go away. He just, how does he do that? Achilles feels the rage well up inside his chest and he makes it disappear. Achilles walks out to the porch. And he lifts Hector's body up in his hands. Achilles lifts Hector's body up in his own hands and puts it in Priam's wagon. It's done, old man. I have put his body in your wagon. No, no, my men will make up a bed for you on the terrace. In the morning, you can go see him and you can take him back to Troy. And one more thing, how many days do you need for the funeral? Oh, well, we need time to prepare the memorial. We're far from the hills. We need to gather timber for the pyre. Nine days to mourn him, a day for the funeral, and one more for a feast in his honor. Eleven days. We need eleven days, and on the twelfth day we will fight again, if that is absolutely necessary. Done. I'll tell my men, I'll tell the Greeks, stop fighting for 11 days. And Priam nods and says, take me to bed. And he reaches his hand to Achilles and Achilles catches him and takes him out to the terrace, to the bed that his men made for Priam and lays him down to sleep. And Paris and Priam sleeps, dreaming of the journey home. And Achilles sleeps, dreaming of his father and the Greek soldiers sleep, dreaming of the battle to come, and the sentries even sleep. The Trojans in the hillsides all around, the farmers sleep, <clears throat> the animals sleep. Even up in Mount Olympus, great Zeus lays his head on Hera's shoulder and falls asleep. tell you what happens next. I know you all know it. It's that trick they did with the Trojan horse. How the Greeks all just pretended to leave. They sailed around the point and in the city of Troy they thought the war was over. They thought the days of peace would come again. Everyone except for Cassandra who had some gift of prophecy. Everyone else thought the days of peace had come again. But that night the Greek soldiers slipped out, and they started the slaughter, and the burning, and the sack of Troy. That's, uh, I don't want to sing that song. The song of the death of King Priam. And the song of the death of Achilles. The song of of Hector's son, Nestianix, being thrown from the battlements. You know how a Greek soldier held him up in one hand and the baby laughed, you know? The helmet made him think of his father and this time he thought it was a joke. You know, the sound of the, the baby's head splitting on the pavement below, the song of all the, the Trojan women, all of them raped, all of them kidnapped, hauled off to Greece. The song of Aeneas escaping on his father's shoulders, the song of uh, Odysseus trying and trying and trying to get home again. You know, it's, frankly, it's just too much, all of these songs. You, know, you can imagine for yourself what it looked like. The destruction of a city, the destruction of a civilization. You know, I, I'll be honest with you. Uh, 
I'll be honest with you, it always it looks pretty much the same. Alexandria, and all that history lost, all the libraries, all the books, Constantinople burning for weeks, the Aztec temples raised, Dresden, Hiroshima, Sarajevo, Kabul, Aleppo. I'll tell you this. Um, Cassandra was the first to see them coming. Priam with the body of Hector in his wagon back from the Greek camps that day. And all of Troy went down to meet him. And Priam told them all of the ceasefire, that there would be no fighting for 11 days, that they would have time to bury Hector's body the proper way. And so they prepared the tomb, and they went to the hills for wood, for the pyre, and they mourned him for nine days. And on the 10th day, they burned his body until the sun came up. Do you see?